cordial uh, welcome uh, to everyone in here. Uh, one person uh, in particular, Katharina, I can't see you now anymore. There you are. Um, so always proudly uh, announced the UFG Peaceful Change Lecture Series, right? And uh, Katharina koch trappel she's the Secretary General of the, um, uh, of the Austrian Research Association that, uh, that generously funds this project. And I'm very happy to see her, but today it's especially important actually because we've tried with Ari four times that he comes. <laughs> and uh, Katharina has helped us there a lot. And uh, the plans obviously originated before COVID, yeah. And then we had to reschedule, and we had to reschedule, and we had to reschedule. And now, finally, uh, you are here. And therefore, an extra huge round of applause for Ari that he made it. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me quickly introduce him uh, to you. Uh, I first came across him when I was studying at, uh, at McGill, and I got all kinds of books from the library and I was interested in border disputes, and I was interested in border disputes, especially in Africa. And, um, and then I found uh, quite a few things from, from, from Ari on, on basically peaceful territorial change in West Africa. And um, then I looked a little further, and then I uh, discovered uh, all kinds of other interesting uh, books on territorial change, and then later on, on zones of peace. And uh, there really are very few scholars in the field that have as much expertise in what one would call probably comparative regionalism. Yeah? Uh, so Ari has worked on quite a few regions, Latin America uh, a lot, uh, West Africa I mentioned already. Uh, he's very knowledgeable about the Middle East as well, um, and, and you'll hear that today. Um, much of, uh, I think some of what he's going to draw uh, today uh, is from a chapter in the Oxford Handbook on, on Peaceful Change. Um, and uh, some of you were here uh, when, we, when we discussed it a little in an, in an, in an earlier um, IDS here as well, in an earlier uh, lecture as well. And um, so, so all of that makes me, makes me all the more happy that, uh, that, that you're here, Ari. And uh, he's going to talk today about the Middle East. And um, for those of you who are interested in other regions, uh, so we have a web page that is hosted by the Diplomatic Academy uh, of the, the, the UFG Peaceful Change uh, Working Group. And uh, you're going to see that we've treated uh, lots, we have dealt with lots of regions uh, already. So Africa was the very first one uh, we addressed, it was the very first lecture some years ago actually now uh, in, this, in this lecture series and then obviously dealt with Europe and, and, and in Asia and so on and so forth and now it's the Middle East. So without any further ado, um, Ari, again thanks a lot that you're here, very happy to have you and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Good evening everybody, you can hear me right and then in the second part I would ask you to use the mic since I only hear one side. It's a really real pleasure to be here in Vienna. So I will talk for about half an hour. Usually that's what all lecturers we say. We talk for half an hour and then we go forever, right? But I'll try to stick until 6.45 or so because uh, I'm always more interested in listening to you than listening to, uh, to myself. And as I mentioned, this is the last time I was in Vienna was about uh, 20 years ago, a long time ago, that uh, we had a conference and out of that came a book that we edited with uh, a couple of uh, Swedish scholars and uh, late another uh, Israeli scholar who passed away, Kovar uh, Simantov, Stable Peace Among Nations. And I always say that for the Swedish, this is an assumption or it's a fact for Israelis, it's a... It's a dream. Uh, I have been enjoying Vienna for the last week using the Vienna Pass, uh, using the city bike, and even learning a little bit to some extent about some of the topics that I want to share with you. Uh, for instance, uh, it's kind of amazing uh, seeing all the palaces and the Habsburg Empire, how this country to some extent shrink Right? And partly it shrink peacefully. That's one first comment. Second, and it's funny, it's a 
we use in Hebrew the term chutzpah, right? It's the shameless advice because you are local. Uh, we discovered, my wife and I, this wonderful museum, the Friedensreich Hunderwasser Museum. And in that museum, you can see the exhibition that he designed many types of flags, including dreaming about a, a Jewish Islamic federation. So I invite you to look at that. And in that same museum, you can see the exhibition by the photographer Susan Mancellas. And she wrote a book in 1997 about the fate of the Kurds that I'm going to mention as well. And last but not least, I had some idea, but I uh, uh, did not realize to what extent what was peculiar about the Habsburgs when we talk about peaceful change or peaceful territorial change or enlarging their borders, they didn't do that through war or they didn't do that through treaties, they did that through marriages, through political marriages. And that's kind of uh, peculiar. So what I will try, first and foremost, I want to thank my host, uh, Professor Doctor. Here is Professor Doctor, right? According to the German tradition, Professor Doctor Marcus Com Com If I pronounce, it's like, and Katrina for bringing me. me. It took a lot of perseverance, fourth time. So, and I feel like in a classroom, since I guess most of you are graduate students here. Okay, so I want to invite you to engage with me later on in a Q&A, in a conversation. And again, to clarify, there are two elements to this talk, one on peaceful change and another on the Middle East. Although I teach about the Middle East and I have a class about theories of international relations and realities of the Middle East, and I study and I teach essentially about the Arab-Israeli, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I don't consider myself a true Middle Eastern expert. If you don't speak Arabic, you are not a true Middle Eastern expert. I see myself, even with my Latin American accent, as a peace scholar. I wrote about peace. I could you know, give you a seminar throughout the night talking about peace and peaceful change. And as Marcus, you refer to, this is, the talk is based more or less uh, in the chapter that uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Galia Pressman and myself, we wrote for the TV poll volume that I strongly recommend to you. It's, a, you know, it's like a, a telephone book, right? It's really a, a handbook, a thick one, about peaceful change, right? Since your professor and myself are among those who have been interested in peace and peaceful change in particular, okay? So the other way around. Okay, so I will start very briefly, and I guess some of you might have an idea, defining peaceful change and different ways of looking at peaceful change, defining the Middle East, and I promise, although there is a lot of there, I'll try to be concise. How has peaceful change has occurred in the Middle East? Because the first impression you can get from the title of this talk, it's an oxymoron, right? You hear about the Middle East, you don't hear about peaceful change. The two, they don't come together. What are the current and future prospects for peaceful change in the region? Since we are international relations scholars, so a bit about theory, realism, liberalist constructivism regarding peaceful change in the area. Then I will move into more particular cases. I will briefly refer to the Kurdish issue. Since the Middle East, it's not just about the Israel-Palestinian conflict and of course the Arab-Israeli conflict. I will mention two regional institutions that they play some kind of role regarding peaceful change. One is the Arab League, the other is the Gulf Cooperation Council. And finally, I would briefly refer to the issue of domestic politics and peaceful change. When we wrote that chapter, we celebrate Tunisia. As the outlier, I think nowadays, I don't know whether to take Tunisia out of the equation as the only country that survive the Arab Spring. So that's the agenda. Okay. So, peaceful change. What we mean by peaceful change, and I apologize, you know, we professors like to quote ourselves, but again, there are not many people who wrote about peaceful change also for the sake 
of reading about peaceful change, those of you who study international relations, which are probably all of you, right? So you should be familiar with E.H. Carr, 20 Years Crisis, right? You might know that book. He has a chapter on peaceful change. By the way, it's the revised version. In the original version, uh, for instance, the Munich Agreement was a wonderful example of peaceful change. That changed after that. And I also want to mention another name uh, who was my advisor in the US many years ago at Princeton, Robert Gilpin. Robert Gilpin wrote about systemic peaceful change. When we talk about peaceful change in general terms, we are talking about a process of the alteration of the status quo. The reality changes by means and ways other than war. So you could say peaceful change might be the functional equivalent to war. And in processes of peaceful change, we assume some degree of cooperation between the parties involved, some degree of negotiations and bargaining. Now, one thorny issue is whether coercion might be peaceful change. Peaceful change cannot be violent. But how about power relations? So E.H. Carr used to say, in peaceful change, we have to find a balance between considerations of power and considerations of norms. And there are much, many examples of peaceful change, more than you could imagine. But today, this evening, we are going to talk about those in the Middle East. Now, peaceful change is a broad issue that has been understudied in international relations, but it's a big issue. And if it's a big issue, we can think about that at different levels of analysis. When we talk about global peaceful change, what it comes to mind, and again, at least in the monologue, I will not refer to that. We might talk about that later on. It goes beyond the Middle East. It's the future of the US-Chinese relations. Would they go for an hegemonic war? Would they adapt to themselves? There are not many examples of systemic peaceful change. I can tell you stories about how the UK gave its hegemony over the Americas to the nephew, to the USA. It's almost the exception to the rule. There is regional peaceful change, and we might refer to that. There is peaceful change at the regional level, whether in Latin America, whether in Europe, whether in the Middle East. TV poll, for instance, refers to peaceful change sometimes as peaceful foreign policy change. What I'm going to emphasize, essentially, would be cases of peaceful change that might take place at the bilateral level. Two countries that they might transfer territory from one to another by peaceful means. And last but not least, although I would not refer to that. We might talk about peaceful change at the domestic level. Imagine the transition from apartheid South Africa to the multi-ethnic democracy in the 90s. That was a case of domestic peaceful change. OK? So when we talk about peaceful change, we talk about change by peaceful means versus status quo, which is no change, leaving the situation as it is. And I would immediately refer to the reality of the Middle East and reflect that in the Middle East, for most of the relevant actors, peaceful change is not the best option because they prefer to stay with the situation as it is. Status quo is the default option for most of the actors involved, except the Kurds, except the Palestinians, except Perhaps we could add Iran to that list and radical Islamic groups. And another way of looking at peaceful change, again, I don't know whether I will have the time to refer to that within the 23 minutes remaining or so, we can think about peaceful change in theoretical terms. And again, probably I'm telling you things that you already know, right? From a realist perspective, usually there is some reluctance or there is some doubt about the possibility of peaceful change, right? Usually, when we talk about peaceful change, we tend to focus on a liberal framework, right? Institutions, security communities, 
and constructivists with their emphasis on ideas and norms, they might also have something to say about that. Okay, let's move on. When we talk about, when we refer to the uh, Middle East, and here you see a map of that, actually we refer to the Middle East are North Africa, MENA, right? We are referring to the 22 members of the Arab League, several sub-regions, the Maghreb, the uh, Nile Valley, the area that you are interested in, right, Marcus, the Horn of Africa, the Fertile Crescent, that's the focus of the Middle East. I apologize, I come from Jerusalem. You might say this is an ethnocentric statement, but if you look at the map, Israel, and if you don't know anything about that, geopolitically, it's at the center of the Israel-Palestine, it's at the center of the Fertile Crescent, right? The Fertile Crescent includes Israel, Israel-Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq. Then we have the uh, Arabia Peninsula. So we have there 22 Arab countries, and we have there three Arab, sorry, three non-Arab countries, namely Israel, Iran, Turkey. Well, Turkey is a complicated case, right? Sometimes it's Europe, sometimes it's the Middle East. Okay? And again, as I mentioned, when we think about the Middle East, there have been several, many even, conventional wars involving the Arab countries and Israel. Since 1948, there is a typo, it's 56, it's not the Crusades, right? And all the way to 73, the Iran-Iraq war, right? Which was the most cruel and difficult war in the Middle East. The Gulf War, 91, the invasion of Iraq, 2003. Many civil wars happening in the Middle East, including those that still are raging in Syria, in Yemen, and several asymmetrical military conflicts involving Israel in Lebanon twice, Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip several times, including this year. So again, you might ask yourself, this is not the usual region to talk about peaceful change, right? I can come back to Vienna next time after the lockdown and talk about peaceful change in Latin America and tell you how Brazil enlarged its borders with the Baron de Rio Branco much better than Bismarck. Probably you don't know the story, but here we are talking about the Middle East. So when you look at the, the, the figures, the facts, it does not seem to be the region that we can talk about peaceful change. But still, Galia and myself try to refer to that, and that's what I'm going to do in the next 17 minutes. First, when you look at this table, you'll find that in the Middle East, there have been several cases of what we can refer as peaceful territorial change, where territory has been exchanged, a gaining party, a seeding party, Right? And again, we can broaden the definition so we can think about the attempt that eventually failed of Egypt and Syria becoming a union. Right? Uh, Egypt and Sudan, they changed a certain area. Then Syria, after a couple of years, did not like to be included within Egypt, so seceded. Right? There have been some exchange of territories, not very relevant. The UAE which is United Arab Emirates. It's a recent creation that came out of a union following independence from the UK. There is an interesting case that involved in 75 Iran and Iraq, the session of the Shat el Arab area, that later on, in a sense, a, that agreement did not work and you have the war between Iran and Iraq. Uh, what is interesting, and I want to emphasize, and again, that list is partial, are a series of peaceful territorial change involving the Arab-Israeli conflict, right? Probably the most important one is the cession or the return of the Sinai Peninsula from Israel to Egypt in 1979. Then 10 years later on, Israel lost an arbitration, so it returned a, a, a little piece of territory. 
And there have been a couple of cases involving Israel and the PLO within the framework of the Oslo process. And there has been another case involving Israel and Jordan in 1994. Okay? So moving into the different levels of analysis, remember that I mentioned we can think about peaceful change at the global level, at the regional level, okay? So at the global level, again, I don't have much to say, but we can talk about the impact of great powers or global structures upon the region. And in general terms, we make the argument that there, the impact has been quite limited. Still, there is an interesting colonial heritage. You might say the borders in the Middle East came out of the Sykes-Picot Agreement about 105 years ago. And that board, those borders were disputed by ISIS, but in general terms, you could say that the borders that they were set by the UK and France, uh, which was even not at the end of World War I, it was even during World War I, right? They were already uh, dividing the spoils of the Ottoman Empire, are the borders that define the Middle East. By the way, as Marcus was saying, that I like to compare regions, this is basically the logic of a principle which is called uti possidetis, right? which is the recognition of the colonial borders. So the Middle East, in that sense, is not very different from other regions like Africa or Latin America, that the borders were, in a sense, devised in a very artificial way by the colonial powers. And they stay as they were. So with the exception of the Arab-Israeli conflict, the borders have not changed uh, uh, very much. So the modern states of the Arab Middle East come after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, right, which is parallel to the collapse of the, this empire, right, by the end of uh, World War I, okay? Later on, there has been some involvement of the UK and France until 1956, and after 56, we have the United States and the late uh, Soviet Union, but again, they were more interested in maintaining the status quo than in bringing about peaceful change. So you could make the argument that the great powers prolong the Arab-Israeli conflict by supporting their respective clients rather than bringing about peace. Still, I want to say maybe a positive word. You can criticize me about the role of the U.S especially after the 70s, for its own reasons. There is no altruism in international relations. There is no much of that. The U.S. promoted on a bilateral setting peace processes in the Arab-Israeli conflict. I want to mention essentially, although he got the Nobel Peace Prize a bit delayed, he deserved that, that's Jimmy Carter. President Carter and his role in mediating the negotiations between Israel and Egypt at Camp David in 78 and then leading to the peace process. That's one major actor, right? But still a very, very limited, a, a very limited role. And maybe we could mention, since we are here at the EU, Right? You could mention that as an alternative avenue for the promotion of peaceful change, you have the EU that has embarked in a very ambitious project of promoting domestic economic liberalization through the European Mediterranean Partnership, what used to be called the Barcelona process, right? And in a sense, you could say that the EU by promoting trade, by promoting norms, by promoting democracy, again, tries to bring about peaceful change in the region, okay? So that's one element. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you like a broad picture, then I would be happy really to uh, uh, engage in a conversation. Okay, let's move to the regional level, okay? So I don't want to talk about the uh, U.S., 
or the Soviet Union. China was not in the picture at that time, or EU, but let's talk about the regional actors. You know, it's when, when I teach Latin America, uh, sometimes many classes in Latin America have been talking about relations between the US and Latin America, but there's a lot going on within the region, within the dynamics of the region. So if we want to make sense of the dynamics within the Arab Middle East, I would say there are two elements that have been run for a long time. One is a competition for regional hegemony among some of the most important Arab countries, and their identity has changed over time. Once upon a time, it was Egypt versus Iraq in the 50s, right? I don't think that's the case for Egypt. Right now, it might be the competition between Saudi Arabia, even the UAE, although it's a small country, and non-Arab countries, right? But there is a competition for regional hegemony because in the Middle East, we have never had an hegemon. And if you ask me, Israel never wanted that role. Israel wanted to be left alone, and it's not an Arab country, it's part of the Middle East. The other element that runs to explain the dynamics of the region is the so-called the Palestine question, the Arab-Israeli conflict, okay? And within that context, in the uh, uh, Arab Middle East, you have different ideas and different identities. You have the idea of an Arab nation, the Kaumia, and you have also state nationalism, like in other regions as well, okay? And the two major conflicts that could involve the possibilities of violent or peaceful change have been the Kurdish problem and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Now, the Kurdish problem as a regional challenge for peaceful change, and I want to mention very briefly the Kurdish issue, I think, I mean, they are similar to the Palestinians that they don't have a state. But unlike the Palestinians, and I think that's they are, a, a, you could say, they are obstacle. The Kurdi Kurdistan is divided among five different countries, right? Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and uh, Azerbaijan, which used to be part of the Soviet Union. So the possibility for the Kurds to have their own independence, it's probably very, very difficult, and they pose a challenge to the possibility of a peaceful change. When I look at the two institutions in the Arab Middle East and the role that they play regarding peaceful change, I can refer to the Arab League. And as I mentioned, you have those two elements. The Arab League em embodies it's like a Westphalian framework, a Arab sovereignty versus the idea of an Arab nation, and there you have a tension. Now, the Arab League had a limited role in preventing violence. What is interesting, and I might return to that, although I'm looking at the, uh, on my watch, and I have about 10 minutes to go. It's interesting when you look at the Arab League, the Arab League has changed its approach regarding the Arab-Israeli conflict. After the war of 1967, the Arab League embodied the rejection of negotiations with Israel, peace with Israel, normalization with Israel. And later on in 2002, and this is something I'm telling my Israeli students that they don't know almost anything. In 2002, you should know that the Arab League came with the Arab Peace Initiative although in a terrible timing at the time of the Second Intifada, but the Arab League came with three yes. And like the three no's at Khartoum, they said we are ready to negotiate with Israel, we are ready to normalize relations and make peace with Israel under certain conditions. So in that sense, the Arab League has moved in the direction of facilitating peaceful change. The other interesting institution it's more limited in membership, it's the JCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council in the Gulf region that was launched in 1981, including Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, Oman, 
and the UAE. And in a sense, they had an economic logic, a security logic, and also came against the Iranian threat. And some authors, like uh, our colleague Charlie Kapchan, would refer to that as a kind of a, a plur pluralist security community. So there is some potential to think about the Gulf Cooperation Council as an example of regional peaceful change. Okay, let me move very quickly, and I guess we'll continue with that in the Q&A, because for that I need an hour, another hour, and that has been the focus of some of my research and writing. It's that the interactive bilateral level, you'll find examples of peaceful territorial change in the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Probably the most interesting example, and was the first one, is the case of the Israeli-Egyptian negotiations that took place in 77-79, leading to the Israeli withdrawal from Sinai, which is three or four times the size of tiny Israel. And the two countries have been living in peace, not in harmony. It's not a fairy tale. I always say it's a cold peace, sometimes it's a frozen peace, but it's peace as absence of war since 1979 until today, which is almost eternity in terms of the Middle East. Okay? And again, when you think about that, it's not the war of 73 that led to the withdrawal, but it was, it was the combination of several factors President Sadat and Begin and Carter that led the two countries to that uh, process. The Israeli-Palestinian negotiations that we can talk, you know, for a long time, again, it's a complicated one. Some might say it's a case of secession, decolonization, quest for independence. And when you think about that, the two parties tried since 1993. Nowadays, you might say it has failed. Some might say the process is completely over, but still the parties are invoking that process. And to some extent, it started at Oslo. That process put in motion some mechanisms of peaceful change, the fact that the West Bank is divided into three areas, the fact that the Gaza Strip is almost like an independent country, came out of a logic of peaceful territorial change. The Israeli-Jordanian case is an easier case because the two parties formalized peace after they had a de facto peace, but that included some territorial withdrawal and I mention here, as a non-example, the Israeli-Syrian negotiations that took place for 20 years. They got almost to the moment of signing a peace treaty, but it failed. And I, we, I added that because it's not in the chapter, it's just to realize the difference, and it's probably, if I'm critical, the only perhaps positive legacy from the Trump administration regarding the Middle East, you have a case of conflict resolution, the so-called Abraham Accords from September 2020, but there is no territorial dispute involved, involving Israel, the UAE, and uh, Bahrain. Okay? Almost to complete my half hour and stick to the... <laughs> you don't have to be German to be punctual. Even with my Latin American accent, you can still be punctual. When we think in domestic terms, when we think in domestic terms, and this is also a, a very interesting a, a topic and theme to discuss, we can think about the impact of the Arab Spring. And the Arab Spring at the beginning, this is 10 years ago, at least Marcus and I, I'm older than you, Marcus, but we remember that. I don't know whether the students here remember that. There were lots of expectations regarding a process of democratization like it happened in Eastern Europe, 
like it happened in uh, uh, Latin America, right? But again, that did not materialize. And there are several uh, explanations for that. Our colleague Ethel Solingen refers to ruling coalitions, right? The preference for nationalist military coalitions. We had the case of Tunisia that survived the Arab Spring without having a counter-revolution or without having civil wars, but right now I think the president has taken a, an authoritarian a, a term, right? Now, in theory, and here I want to add as a reflection, and here I recommend to all of you to read one of the few IR scholars that you read that it's interesting reader and you don't fall asleep, that's John Mueller. And John Mueller wrote about that. Usually in IR, we say, we see a relationship between democracy and peace, democratic peace. Now in the Middle East, I'm not so, and again, don't misunderstand me, I prefer, you know, <laughs> democracy and I prefer peace. But in the Middle East, it might be an outlier. It's not clear whether if you would have processes of democratization, that would lead to peace in the Middle East. After all, Israel signed peace agreements with authoritarian regimes, right? So, so that's a reflection that we have to keep in mind. Again, I'm reluctant to adopt the very stereotypical approach by Huntington that uh, if you remember the thesis, right, that Islam and democracy are incompatible, right? You have to be very careful about that. But again, it might be the case, it's not completely clear whether democracy would lead to peace in this region. And the chances for domestic peaceful change in the region, they are not very encouraging. So just to conclude, to be in time and to live, if you want, you know, I'm at, uh, here uh, at your service. Uh, what did I do? Okay, the conclusions. Okay, so several points to keep in mind. Regional peaceful change in this region, like in other regions of the world, they depend on the uh, international context. The external involvement of great powers, they have been much better in conflict management than in conflict resolution and in bringing about peaceful change. Perhaps with the exception of the US regarding Israel and Egypt. Second point, the two Arab regional organizations, and again, I'm reluctant to adopt what once uh, Michael Barnett and Ethel Solingen wrote about the Arab League, they are uh, doomed to fail, right? They don't play any significant role. I'm, I think that's <coughs> a very uh, 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 unfair depiction because they play a role. It might be a limited role. They might prefer the status quo, but they might promote a peaceful change. I didn't say much about constructivism and I have this argument with your former advisor. I always say you don't have to believe in norms to become a constructivist because Emmanuel Adler is constructivist everywhere, right? But it's clear that ideas, identities, and norms, they play a very important role in affecting the likelihood of peaceful change at the regional and bilateral levels. So for instance, I could compare here the Arab League with the OAS. They can play those regional organizations a role in providing international legitimacy, right? The Arab League, for instance, played some role regarding the Arab Spring, for instance, in giving the kosher stamp for the international intervention against Libya, right? So in that sense, <coughs> the regional organizations might play a role in providing a, a legitimacy, okay? Now, I would say, and again, that's a truism, 
And, you know, if you are students of IR, you should know that. You know, I have been 30 years in the trade, and by the end of the day, you realize it's all, I think Kissinger said that. It's all about domestic politics. You know, I can tell you a, a little anecdote. Kissinger, you have Kissinger in the entrance to this institution, right? So Kissinger used to um, mediate, after the Yom Kippur War, the interim agreements between Israel and uh, Egypt and Syria, and he was welcoming Israel by demonstration, calling him anti-Semitic, which is a problem because he's very Jewish, right? And he got fed up and he said, Israel does not have a foreign policy, it's all about domestic politics. And in that sense, you could say the domestic political context is important to understand the possibility of peaceful change. And again, it, that, it might not have to do with democratic peace. It might have to do with the quality of leadership, domestic legitimacy, what Zarman calls the reentry problem, right? You send a spaceship of making peace, you have to return to planet Earth and get your constituency, okay? A fourth reflection, or a, 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 I think a fifth, Reflection, we might see a resurgence of great power politics and regional power politics in the region, but not necessarily with the United States. Here you might find a lot of continuity between Obama, Trump, and Biden nowadays. And there is no vacuum in politics, so Russia is back, or regional powers like Turkey and Iran. So by the end of the day, when we think about peaceful change, again, we have to come back to this distinction that E.H. Carr made many, many years ago, 100 years ago almost, between who are the status quo, who are the revisionists, right? But what I try to convey, and if I confuse you, maybe I fulfill that goal, is that we have to be aware of stereotypes. And even in a region like the Middle East, we may find examples and possibilities of peaceful change. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can get rid of the tie now. Yes. <laughs> I don't use the tie usually, you know, the tie comes. I'm advertising Hebrew University, right? <laughs> but uh, it took me like 10 minutes to make the tie, right? <laughs> so. So. Now we come to the informal part, basically. So, so feel free to ask questions, and uh, then Ari is going to answer them without a tie. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have our Facebook uh, stream, of course. I'm looking at the camera there. And, uh, and feel free to ask questions as well. I anticipate quite a few. So we'll even do blocks of five at a, at a time. And I'm going to start with two that I have from the... Mm -hmm. um, from the from the Facebook, and I just read it to you, and then uh, and then we have for each side we have someone who's gonna who's gonna uh, help them in terms of the questions. Uh, so the first question is uh, is by by Morges, uh, a former student of ours from from last year. Uh, it's a fairly uh, difficult question. <laughs> um, what are the major sticking points or stumbling blocks for peaceful change in the Middle East in general? and Israeli-Palestinian relations in particular. So that's a, that's a big one. Okay. Um, the second one uh, by Christoph Fellner um, is, could an economic or a monetary community be a model for the Gulf Cooperation Council? So that's uh, two very different questions. And then we're going to start with, uh, with the audience here. And, uh, and there, let's, let's start there in the middle, and then, uh, and then we're going to move uh, to the other side. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take it off when you no, speak. I, yeah. I, you, I so need I to hear you. Yeah, so identify yourself quickly. And, and, yeah. and, and tell me your name, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful uh, yeah. no. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Cameron. Um, my second student. 
Uh, I have two questions for you, Professor. The first one is how you will evaluate the change of the political tone of Saudi Arabia towards Israel, like uh, supporting Israel against Iran, and it's kind of contradicting the Mujahideen and um, Jihad uh, values of Saudi. And the second uh, question regarding the democracy, um, could be the Lebanese political model applicable in Israel in order to calm down the politic, uh, calm down the different ethnical and religious tension within, tensions within Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then we're going to we move over so there. Far. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ari, I'm That's sorry. Fine. But there's so much there's so much to say about the Middle East that I knew that there would be. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Eloisa. Eloisa? Eloisa. Eloisa. Yes. I would like to ask if you think the two it's your voice, Eloisa. I would like to ask if you think the two state resolution for the is Arab Israeli uh, conflict is dead or not? Or if it is, uh, do you think any other possibilities to deal with that? Okay. Um, if the uh, two-state solution is dead, and if it is, if you have any other like possibilities to deal with the conflict, other other possibilities to deal with the conflict. Ah, okay. So uh, I think let's let's leave it at that for the for the for the for the for the first round because <laughs> already already big already big okay. questions. Yes. Okay. The two that came from the you can hear me, right? I mean. Yes. I always had a complaint at home from the family. You shout all the time because <laughs> I don't So, uh, and I can read that actually, right? <laughs> what are the major, the major sticking points or stumbling blocks for peaceful change in the Middle East in general and Israel-Palestinian relations in particular? Um, I would go, I would focus upon the Israel-Palestinian relation because again, to answer that, to talk about a peaceful change in, in, in general in the Middle East, you might talk about uh, uh, different identities, culture, schisms within uh, Islam, uh, Sunni Shia. So uh, although it sounds more complicated since I'm, I'm, I'm teaching a class on the second part of that question for the last 20 years, so I can tell you there is a long list of stumbling points regarding the Israeli-Palestinian relationship, okay? Just to name a few, and again, uh, in this hour and a half, you are like my students, right? So I would say, go and read the documents. Read the permanent issues to be ad addressed according to the Oslo One framework. Jerusalem is a major sticking point. Within Jerusalem, the area which is called the, is sacred for both Jews and Muslims, right? The Temple Mount area. That's a major sticking point. A second major sticking point is the issue of Palestinian refugees. Originally 600, 700,000, today with our kids and grandkids, 5 million. That's a major sticking point. Then you have the issue of settlements in the West Bank. That's another sticking point. I would add, in terms of identity, right, to follow the logic of constructivism, there is a significant problem for both parties in recognizing each other. So for many Palestinians, they refer to Jews in religious terms. It's very hard for them to recognize the logic of a partition plan, right? And that's what makes the conflict, many might say, intractable. I don't agree with that. I follow, and this is another bibliographical recommendation. The best book, if you want to read about the Israeli-Palestinian relation, it's called Israel-Palestine by my a close friend, Alan Doughty. He has several editions of that, and he says it's basically two peoples claiming the same piece of land. Okay, but I think I answer that. I answer that in detail because I know more about that question than about the second question, right? I mean, to what extent an economic monetary and community be a model for the JCC? I think the JCC was framed initially as a kind of economic framework, right? But then it added a security uh, dimension. And 
again, you see within the JCC, until recently, you have this uh, gap or this schism, right, between Qatar and the others, right? Why? Because Qatar supported the Muslim Brotherhood. So I don't think that uh, uh, adopting a, an economic monetary community model, which sounds pretty much like, the, like what we have here, that might promote that. I would add from that question in more general terms that uh, many times there were attempts to apply the European model, which I really uh, respect as a peace scholar. I think this is a miracle what you have in this continent, right, in general terms. But sometimes you ignore the possibility of translating that. So, for instance, uh, uh, Shimon Peres uh, used to have this new Middle East idea in the early 90s about modeling upon Europe, right? Or I can give you another example, which is less political correct. Go and read the Trump plan. It's easy reading. They made it for Trump, okay? It's 140 pages, but it's mostly figures and pictures. And it's modeled on a logic of economic cooperation and interdependence, but it does not apply to the realities on the ground. Okay. Um, your two questions. Steve, one, the name? Cameron. Okay. Cameron. 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 See, Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> Apologize. Okay. Now, why Saudi Arabia move in the direction of Israel? Okay. So again, I would say, unlike the UAE or Bahrain, Saudi Arabia has not formally normalize its relations. But Saudi Arabia move in the direction of Israel because they share some economic interests, they share some security interests, as you mentioned, the uh, Iranian threat, although lately Saudi Arabia and Iran are normalizing relations, okay? Some witty uh, political commentator in Israel used to say that Israel is a very status quo conservative country that in a sense cares for all the interests of the Sunni Arab countries except for the Palestinians, right? So you have a commonality of interests. They, they used to be, or they are both aligned with the United States. They stick to the status quo, right? Still, I think there in Saudi Arabia we have a generational gap between the king and, the, and uh, uh, Muhammad bin Salman, right? So again, it's not clear. I mean, it would really be a sea change whether Saudi Arabia would normalize relations with Israel before resolving the Palestinian issue. Now, it's interesting that you ask about the Lebanese model to be adapted or adopted within Israel. Well, the Lebanese model that many of us, we know that from comparative politics, consociational democracy, I think it worked, but not completely well. I mean, you saw a couple of civil wars, virulent civil wars in Lebanon involving neighboring countries like Syria and Israel. Today, I don't think Lebanon can be a model, right? Now, what we have in Israel, it's also very strange because I would say that within the borders of the state of Israel, you might still have a kind of functioning democracy. You might follow that, that we have a very strange political coalition, right? That after many, many years that you could say this was domestic peaceful change, <laughs> right? Netanyahu is the leader of the opposition, right? He might end in jail. I'm, not, I'm, I'm never political correct. I know on Facebook, you also have a former uh, prime minister that uh, <laughs> you can complete the phrase, okay? But what I'm saying, I don't know whether you can uh, uh, use the Lebanese. Now, I can come and refer to your question and, ref and relate that to a Luisa. Because you might say, within the consociational democracy, and if you refer to the Israel-Palestinian equation, maybe the model should be a kind of a 
secular, one state democracy for everybody. But the problem is that I think Lebanon, which is not Belgium, which is not Switzerland, which is not Canada, might demonstrate the perils of a consociational democracy or multi-ethnic democracy. Okay? Now, in Luisa, and again, I can give you an entire <laughs> spiel, as you say in German, right? But I know this from Yiddish, which is close to German. So you ask me, uh, as a matter of fact, two questions. One is regarding the two-state solution, and the other regarding the alternatives, OK? And again, I can give you, you know, in academia, I can give you the objective, and I try to be objective, but there is no such a thing, right? I know we have to follow Max Weber, right? And <laughs> so I would say that the two-state solution is probably the most rational, the most logic way to go. It's based on the premise of the partition plan. I recommend you, you should read John Kerry's plan. John Kerry, when, uh, after the eight years of Obama, you know, I like President Obama, he's kind of snobbish. Unlike Clinton, he did not came with his plan. So Kerry had a 15 page. As a good students, you can get to the last two pages with the principles, okay? And Kerry refers to 181. 181 is United Nations Resolution Partition Plan, two states for two peoples. And I think the logic makes a lot of sense. By the way, it's not the logic of Lebanon, okay? The problem is, and many people might say, that as we talk, that reality is becoming more and more difficult to implement, okay? Because of what you have in the ground, okay? And again, I can tell you from even my own personal experience, both Israelis and Palestinians might say, this is the best solution, but it would not happen. Why? Because you cannot trust the other people. Okay? But still, the two-state solution makes sense. Whether it would be feasible, that's another question, because that might imply evacuating a large number of settlers. So I don't know whether that would be feasible. So then, if that's not the case, what are the alternatives, right? Because in politics, I learned from a... Uh, elder teacher, you never choose between good and bad, you choose between bad and worse, okay? And it's the art of the possible. So you ask me the question, I'm giving you the academic answer. The alternative to a two-state solution could be a one-state solution. Now, one-state solution comes in two different versions. One is what you ask, or you might imply, we might call it Israstein, it's, yes, Israel's time. It's a combination of Israel and Palestine, okay? And that might be a secular, democratic country, one vote, one person. By the way, that might be the end of Zionism, I mean, the, the national movement for the Jews, and also would contradict the logic of Palestinian self-determination. The other option could be a one state, the malign version. And the malign version is the apartheid version, where one of the two ethnic national groups would rule that. And that's the ideology of Hamas until today, and that's the ideology of some of my you know, a, a fellow citizens back at home would say, you know, we don't have to give the Palestinians political rights. That's what happened in South Africa until 1990. Beyond that, and again, I could elaborate on that, and I'm becoming more and more interested, and you could say it's a kind of hybrid, and now we live in the corona times in the hybrid age, right? Would be a confederation. The confederation idea, it's more or less model than what you have here in the EU. Because you don't have a confederation. I mean, I don't know. Uh, Andorra, it's a <laughs> condominium, but it's something different. Not a federation, right? I learned this week Austria is relatively small, although you are larger than Israel. That's easy, right? But you are a federation. We are a federal country, like Germany. Okay? Switzerland started as Confederation Helvetique, 
but it's actually a federation. A confederation would mean two independent countries sharing a lot of things in common. Think about the EU. Now, I'm becoming more and more convinced, but I still have to teach. That's the wonders of academia, right? That's why Marcus and myself, we are most of the time happy, right, with this profession, is that we still can study, right? So I want to study about that. I think the confederation idea is very intriguing because that might perhaps address the problem of moving people from where they are. The problem with confederation is in the details. I, if I quote a very wise uh, political philosopher, Michael Walzer, he once wrote a wonderful piece say, saying that if you want to transcend the state system, first you have to complete it. So my starting point would be a two-state solution, but after all, the partition plan, that, you know, the partition plan, apropos our talk this evening, was a failure of peaceful change. Because imagine if the partition plan would have happened, that would be a case of peaceful change designed by the UN. And the partition plan referred to two states for two people, a Jewish state, Israel, right? It's called Israel for the Jews and an Arab state in Palestine with an economic union. So they consider that. So just, you know, a very long answer to a very point question. I would say that if I have to choose probably the two-state solution, it's the logical one. I don't know how realistic it is nowadays. Thank you. That was uh, a, a long, a very detailed uh, <laughs> answer. I'm still thinking, yeah. We still no, have time, very, right? Yes. <laughs> no, but no, that's, that's obviously it's a, it's a very complex question. That's one, one of the most complicated questions about peaceful change anywhere. Well, it's in a the complicated the region. In the, in you know, the world, I'm yes, yes. Flying home tomorrow, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, more questions. Who wants to go next? Maybe we're going to move over to the side. Yes, let's just do one, two, three. Yes, my name is Maximilian. Maximilian. I am a MICE 2 student. And my question is, how does international public opinion influence the Israel-Palestine conflict? Do you think it um, helps peaceful change, or is it rather an obstacle? <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andreas Ritzer. I'm a. I cannot uh, hear you. I'm sorry. Good evening. My name is Andreas Ritzer. I'm a DA uh, alumnus, and I've got two questions actually. Um, the first one being, um, what is the role of Qatar in um, the regional peaceful change, especially in the context of the Lebanon, the Saudi Lebanon crisis at the moment? And the second question, I'm not sure if it's, uh, um, I'm moving away too far from, from the region, but it would concern the Abraham Accords um, between Morocco and, and, and Israel. How do the Abraham um, Accords um, influence uh, the political situation in Northern Africa? Um, and what does this mean for Western Sahara? I don't know if you want to talk about that uh, I this lost evening. The last part of Western Sahara. Ah, so okay. Is, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and then I think was there was there anyone else on this? Yes. My name is Benedict. Can shout, you hear me? Shout. Can you hear like me now? In a theater. <laughs> All right. My name is Benedict. Uh, also, my two student. And my question is concerning normalization, so similar to the Abraham Accords. Uh, it's two questions, actually. Um, do you think normalization could be a basis for peaceful change in the, in the Middle East? As you said, for example, the idea of economic peace, the idea of an economic union. Because I, also, I know that there is also the opposite view among Arabs, that it's yes. the death of Pan-Arabism and the yes. death of Arab unity. Uh, and so my second question about normalization is, um, would you say normalization is a promising and stabilizing project for the region, or is it threatening and destabilizing the region? What does it trigger? Thank you. And then we can, uh, yes, and then 
Ja, wir können ich Benedikt. Ben. Benedikt. Ben. Benedikt. 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 Okay. <lacht> I cannot hear you, I'm sorry. Um, hi, my name is Natasha. Shout, you have to shout. Hi, my name is Natasha. So my question is, with China's growing influence in the Middle East, do you think it is a revisionist power that can impact the peaceful of change? China. Wait, wait, that's what I do with my students. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I'm sorry, I don't have the, okay. Um, with China's growing influence in the Middle East, do you China. think, China, yeah, do you think it's a revisionist power that can impact peaceful change in the Middle East? Okay, and what's your name? Natasha. Natasha. Natalia? Natasha. Natasha, okay. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna, um, I, Ari, sorry, I'm gonna add one more question that we have here. Ah, if okay, that's okay that's with easy. you. So from Facebook, uh, I'm gonna read it to everyone. Um, uh, why is Hezbollah currently adamantly defending the political and constitutional status quo ante in Lebanon? Okay. Should so I try to answer and? Uh, you have, you have two hours. <laughs> no. It's fine with me. No. I have to work a little bit. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Let's see if I can understand my... Maximilian, right? That's, I know that from the Mexican history, but that's it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and again, uh, uh, it's interesting that you ask questions. The answer is not clear, right? You ask a very interesting question whether... International public opinion might help or hinder peaceful change or regarding the effect within Israel, right? Because here we are in Europe and, you know, some of my fellow citizens at home think, okay, Europe can impose economic sanctions. Or I think by the end of the day, it's up for the parties to decide whether to, to, they want to move in the direction of peace. So, although I think that the problem with, uh, uh, with my country is that Israel still wants to uh, be seen as part of Europe, liberal, democratic, etc., right? So in that sense, has to take into consideration to some extent the public opinion, but not too much, right? And I think that, again, I'm maybe answering in very general theoretical terms, you have the rallying around the flag effect. So so I'm not sure whether uh, it might really help whether the, you know, the, the international public opinion would make Israel into South Africa, apartheid South Africa, out of stocks. I'm not so sure about that. And again, what I always try to convey to my students, and I always, you know, I thank God that I don't work for the Israeli Foreign Ministry, I work for Hebrew University for the last 30 years, is that it's the, the reality is always much more complicated, right? But in terms of the, again, and don't take my position as representing the public opinion in Israel because it's not, right? I'm part of the intellectual elite with my Latin American accent in Israel. Immediately they identify myself what it's called left in Israel, left and right. It's whether we are in favor or against resolving the conflict. So, so I'm not sure that's, so I would say that it might sometimes be even counterproductive. Now, uh, Andrea, if I, uh, the role of Qatar, I think Qatar is an interesting bridge in the sense that Qatar, uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, Qatar was ostracized for many years by Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the JCC, but they didn't manage. I mean, it's part of the failures of, the, of Muhammad uh, uh, Ben Salman, right, to try to ostracize Qatar. Qatar has been a kind of go-between between Israel and Hamas because it's in good relations with, the, uh, 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 with Turkey and with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. And Qatar is an interesting case, like the UAE, right, that they try to play kind of maverick independent uh, role. And by the end of the day, the JCC survived uh, after this schism, right, between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Now, the second question, uh, I don't think there is a, a direct relationship between the Morocco-Israeli deal and the Western Sahara question. Of course, the link is through what uh, Trump promised or not promised to the Moroccans, right? With the Western Sahara, the Polisario issue is another issue, right? 
that it's uh, still not resolved. So it seems like a, a, a Trump promised the UAE uh, military help or planes or so, so they promised Morocco a recognition. But again, I don't know whether Trump got advice about that, because again, that was against the, the, the traditional position of the US on that issue, right? And to some extent, I would say, although uh, uh, Israel and Morocco normalized relations, first, it's not new. I mean, many of those, that logic of the Abraham Accords, it did not start really with Trump. It just became formalized. And in a sense, this relates to uh, Benedict, two questions. Uh, and uh, you are right that the issue of normalization between Israel, well, Sudan now it's out of the question, right? After the coup, but with the UAE and Bahrain, whether this is a positive or negative process regarding the, the Palestinian issue, that's, a, a, that's up for grabs. Now, I can tell you the rhetorics of the foreign ministers of Bahrain and the UAE, they would say, now we have leverage. Now that we normalize relations with Israel, then we can help the Palestinians. Now, whether they mean that or not, that's an open question. It's like Sadat, that by the end of the day, the Egyptian president made it for a separate peace. In general terms, I would argue as a peace scholar, right, that normalization, diplomacy, it's always a positive thing. Because when you think about the Arab-Israeli conflict, unlike many other conflicts, in many other conflicts like what you had in Europe throughout history, countries, they fight, they go, they, they go to war, they break diplomatic relations. As as Hitler wrote, every war must end. So after the war, you have a Congress of Vienna here, or <laughs> right? So then they normalize relations. In the Arab-Israeli equation, for a long time, that was not the case. So I would say, again, as a peace scholar, and you should know that, the normal situation is that of peace. So although some of my fellows would say, and this is a valid argument, that the Abraham Accords came against the logic of the Arab Peace Initiative that I mentioned before, because the Arab Peace Initiative, in a sense, related the normalization between Israel and the Arab countries to the resolution of the Palestinian conflict. But once you have normal relations, then, again, I think it's a positive thing. Natasha, you ask about China and the Middle East. Now, China has not been involved in the quartet, right, in those uh, members of the international community, EU, UN, US, Russia. China is becoming more and more involved in economic terms. For instance, you should know that China signed a multi-billion agreement with Iran, right? So the Chinese are buying the world, right? And they are led by economic interest, and they are investing in the Middle East. They still, I think, have not assumed the parallel role, or they are not interested maybe in bringing about peaceful change which I would use, you know, that's the abuse. I mean, I didn't talk too much, so now I'm talking too much. You could say the Europeans, they might feel very frustrated because you have a lot of economic investment and relations with Israel, the Palestinians, etc. but that is not translated into political leverage, although you would like that. The Chinese could have the political leverage, perhaps they are not interested at this stage. And finally, and I can read, that's easy, by Pa Fried, or Fried. Uh, now, I don't know what is the status quo ante, because ante means before the war. Hezbollah is defending the status quo to some extent because they are part of the government. I mean, the case with Hezbollah, which also tell us about the complexities of this region, it's both a terrorist organization, that's at least the way we see that in Israel. And there is evidence for that. I was telling Marcus about a, a, my last research, research that it's not necessarily related to the Middle East, but Hezbollah has been responsible for two a, a, a very grave terrorist attacks that happened in Argentina in 92 and 94. But it has a kind of dual identity. It is a terrorist 
organization. It's also involved in crime. But it's also a, a Lebanese political party. And as a Lebanese political party, it has to be aware about the complexities of what Cameron uh, you asked before. OK? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, just give me, give me a sense how many, how many more do you want to ask questions? Then we have one, two, three, four. Five. I can we'll promise do, to try we'll to Then we'll do, we'll, do one, <laughs> we'll, we'll do one more round. Don't be brief, that's okay. okay. It's actually, I really like listening to it. It's um, so always the questions and answers is for me always the highlight, because then it then, uh, becomes more spontaneous. Yes. Yeah. Hi, good evening. I'm um, kind of here. My name is Teresa. Hi. Um, so I have a question. So we heard some examples about where uh, peaceful change actually happened, but do you think that the people on the ground act who experienced like decades of uh, violence and war actually still believe themselves that peaceful change can happen? Because you, for example, mentioned the lack of trust of the people in the case of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And can you maybe elaborate on that further, especially, for example, considering the humanitarian crisis in Yemen? I, I think here much, but I'll try. So the question, <laughs> question was whether, whether, whether people on the ground, so ordinary yes, people, whether the they still believe in peace. Yes. And, um, okay, that's and a great question. And then she gave the example of Yemen, but I think one could probably, that's definitely yes. a great question, yeah. Yes. And uh, then there were, I think, three more hands up. Yes. My name is Elisa. Teresa. Mm -hmm. Teresa. 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 <laughs> I have I'm a translator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Iris, and my question is, you talked about the fact that there are limited opportunities for domestic peaceful change right now. Is there any country that you feel has the best possibility of peaceful change, given the current situation? Do you mean it, do you mean it in domestic politics or as an international I mean actor? In domestic politics. So if one looks at a domestic level, uh, would it be an exemplary state uh, where peaceful change ah, happened okay. very well? Yeah. Okay, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Camera, I'm just going to, maybe then later, because that, you asked uh, okay. two excellent English. questions already. Yes. The, um, uh, sorry, so we went with the, 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 to, the to the front. Oh, Our, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't mm. worry about it. My name is Carmen. Um, thank you for the very interesting talk. I would have a question regarding theory of international relations applied to um, peaceful change. You mentioned it quickly in your introduction, but my question would be, so when it comes to war, one might argue that realism is basically unavoidable to understand um, the dynamics of war. So um, when it comes to peaceful change, what would you say? Is there any of the theories, any of the approaches, be it liberalism, constructivism, post-constructivism, and so on, like um, most crucial to understand and, and, and then um, yes. propagate um, peaceful yes. change? Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, then yes, then in the back. Hello, my name is Sandra. Um, I have a what, question what, what? about Sandra about Sandra? yes about domestic politics. You mentioned the importance, and I wanted to ask if you think that the last three years, with the many parliamentary elections in Israel and the political turmoil, if that had any influence in your opinion, and if so, um, what influence on the regional um, stability and the possibility for peaceful change and peace? Okay, thank you. And then I think we had one more. Gonna go over there now, please. I'm following you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name's Oliver. Um, you said you were skeptical or that we need to be careful about the Huntington thesis. Why then do you think, could you say a bit more about why you think democratic peace is, might not work in the Middle East? Okay. And is everyone happy now? So are there the, the, the one more super... Uh, one, two, thing. three, four, five, six. We're basically, yeah, Jesus, yeah. But I mean, just because it's the last round. So last, last, last. 
Last opportunity. Okay, great. Okay. Ari, then, then, uh, I'll leave, then let's leave it at six. It's already enough. <laughs> okay. Those are great questions, and I don't say that every time, okay? So <laughs> those are really, oops, I don't know. Well, I, uh, okay. Um, I leave that like that, okay? So just, <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's Elsa, right? The question about grassroots? Teresa, yes. Elise? Teresa. Teresa, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Teresa. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's very, very important what you ask because, you know, I had this uh, conversation with uh, another Peace Scholar, a book that I can recommend to you, uh, Roger McGinty from uh, Ireland, uh, he wrote a book about everyday peace. So I had to review a book, his book, and he has to review another book that has nothing to do with peaceful change, although it's about peace, that I recently completed on uh, peaceful borders and transnational crime. Okay, but that's... <laughs> so, and uh, what's the argument? The argument is that usually in all my research, you know, all the issues that I wrote about peaceful change, zones of peace, stable peace, mostly I tend to look, you could say, at the level of leaders or countries, which is kind of uh, top-down. And I think that it's crucial, and I realize now that, you know, I'm older and close to retirement, <laughs> uh, that uh, we tend to forget about people, and real people. And uh, there is a need for grassroots. The problem with grassroots, the argument is that it takes time. So you have to find a balance. You need the right leaders, but you also need the domestic legitimacy, right? And it's clear that part of the problem with some of the failures of those peace processes in the region or elsewhere is that there has been a tendency to ignore the need for popular support. And not the support from the international community, the support from your own people. So whether people believe in peace or not, well, people are traumatized. If you mention the case of Yemen, that's an horrible case. But I can tell you stories that are also horrible from the Second Intifada. With 5,000 Palestinians, mostly civilians, I mean, not involved in terrorism, and more than 1,000 Israelis, including uh, former students and neighbors of mine, that explain the uh, incredulity, I mean, the, the lack of belief and the lack of trust. Think those kids 20 years ago, now, I mean, they are grown-ups, right? So that's a problem. If people don't believe in peace, then you need the right leaders to try to change that. And it's probably easier to say that here at the diplomatic academy than in the ground. Now, uh, Iris? I, Iris? Iris, yeah. Iris is in Spanish, <laughs> but it's... Uh, <laughs> Irish, if you, are, if you ask me, uh, uh, Iris, about an example of domestic... I, I wanted to know if you feel... So you said that there's, you said that there's a limited chance for future domestic peaceful change. Yes. Is there an example of a country that you see has the best chance in the in this foreseeable in the future okay. in the Middle East? Okay, sorry. I, I well, we thought about, about Tunisia, right? But Tunisia, that was the outlier, right? I mean, it was mentioned here, Lebanon has a, a, a record which is close to democracy than, than others, right? When you think about that, it's interesting. When you think back about the Arab Spring, you see that the Arab Spring took place uh, usually in uh, republics that they were ru ruled by military dictators. It did not take place in traditional monarchies, right? Like Jordan or Morocco or, or the Gulf monarchies, right? So, uh, so again, I, I wish I could be more uh, optimistic about that. And, and believe me, and this relates to Huntington and the question of democratic peace, I'm not saying that out of arrogance, right? I mean, 
I, I would say Israel within the, the borders 4967 might be a democracy, but you cannot say Israel is a democracy ruling uh, in the West Bank, right? But what happened in Israel in June, it was a kind of political miracle, right? That you have this coalition, including for the first time, an Arab, a Palestinian political party, which is not a satellite like those during the Labour Times, you know, satellite party, but and, and believe it or not, they are close ideologically to the Muslim Brotherhood. Again, they are not Hamas, but so, so uh, when I look at the, uh, when I try to look around, right, uh, whether uh, there are possibilities uh, for domestic peaceful change, I think Tunisia has the best record, again, due to economic, uh, 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 the socioeconomic situation, the, the role of women in, in Tunisia as compared to other countries in the region, right? And if Tunisia has gone wrong, right, again, if I relate that to, uh, 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 let me find that, to Oliver's question, right? I, I'm opposing the thesis by, uh, by Huntington because I think uh, uh, it's very simplistic. I mean, we all study that. It's very interesting. But it's, and again, maybe I'm here disclosing also my uh, Latin American identity. The last book that Huntington wrote was against the, uh, the Latino minority within the U.S. But the attempt to uh, make the world into several civilizations, right? And you have a Latin American civilization and Islamic civilization and make everything in so simplistic terms. I think it's, uh, to some extent, uh, a very simplistic, even racist, right? I mean, does not take into consideration the, the complexities. Now, this is different from saying that, uh, again, why democratic peace, to have democratic peace in the Middle East, it means that you have to have a diet of democratic countries. The closest that you had you could say it was Lebanon and Israel. And actually, Lebanon and Israel did not see many wars between them. There was a war in 82 between Israel and the PLO. There was a war in 2006 between Israel and Hezbollah. Okay? And what Mueller says, and I tend to agree with him, there is no guarantee that if you have democratization in the Middle East, right, let's say Muslim Brotherhood would gain power, that would make them uh, wanting to make peace with Israel, right? So it's more complicated. Okay, then I have a couple of more questions. Sandra, if I write about the... Now, those elections that we had in Israel, again, it's all about domestic politics, meant that the agenda had nothing to do with the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And even now that you have this strange coalition, including social democratic parties all the way to right-wing religious or, you know, with a very hawkish position means that it would be also very difficult to deal with the Israeli-Palestinian question, right? So the, the change has been domestic, or at least the idea that you have now, I want to believe, a government that works for the people and not a leader that works for himself to run away from justice. Now, the last question is the one that I love, and you know, I could spend hours, which is Carmen on theory, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I, I want to uh, answer again, I would resist the temptation because, you know, as uh, uh, we like to brag our, our, own, our own work. So I could say, well, I wrote about them. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I learned that from E.H. Carr, through Gilpin, right? I mean, I'm not too old to study with E.H. Carr, and you could say, Morgenthau, right? Hans Morgenthau, originally from Germany and moving into the U.S., he also wrote about peaceful change. So even realism, they don't rule out the possibility of peaceful change because you take into consideration power relations, okay? I give you two examples, and one of them I have to do again. I'm not an expert on Habsburg history of your country. But sometimes you can move to peaceful territorial change, for instance, if you have a common threat. And that happened a lot throughout diplomatic history. So you have countries that are facing other threats that bring them together. And that's a realist argument. 
Another realist argument that I tried to develop, and it's even counterintuitive. I made the argument that when a country is more powerful than another one, a symmetrical distribution of power, that might lead to peaceful change if the more powerful country has the, the vision of looking in the long term and has, you could say, the possibility of being magnanimous, not out of altruism. So what I'm saying is that realism does not rule out peaceful change. Obviously, liberalism has more to do with that because you can bring uh, international law and common norms and a Groschen approach, right? And also constructivism might have something to say. This is what uh, uh, Emmanuel Adler wrote about that and Charles Caption wrote about that, right? So what I'm saying is that you could use, and I, I think if we end on that note, we are giving a good uh, advertisement to the network of peaceful change, right, that Marcus yeah. and I, we are involved, is that the theories of IR that we use, they are not designed only to explain war. They can also be used to explain peace and peaceful change. And I would say on that note that you have also different gradations of peace. Peace is not either, you know, harmony and the yellow submarine and uh, the Beatles or war, right? And in that sense, I think theories of IR can be very useful. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Ari, thank you very, very much. That was uh, a very warm and a very long applause. It doesn't always happen. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. And uh, so we have, as usual, we have the opportunity to go next door, have a little reception, and then we uh, can continue everything in more informal fashion. Thanks a lot uh, for being Good here. Luck Thanks to a lot all for asking of you the question. And, uh, survive the lockdown in Israel. We knew about lockdowns too much. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we will prevail. <laughs>